So we manufacture skis here in Salt Lake. But, you know, kind of cheek and jowl with that is that material science polymer chemistry piece. So while we're formulating, we can be prototyping. So we can make an entirely new polymer and actually be on the snow in about three days. Welcome to It's Material World, the show that uncovers why material science will change the world. With your hosts, Pranithi Pavia and Tom Miller. In today's episode, Making Skis from Algae, the Biomanufacturing Process. Hello, everyone. Our guest today is Scott Franklin, the co founder and the chief scientific officer of Checkerspot, a startup focused on synthesizing high performance polyurethane and coatings derived from the oils produced by microalgae. One of the many applications for these biopolymers are backcountry skis sold under their commercial brand, WNDR or Wonder Alpine. Thank you so much for being on the show, Scott. And we are so excited to learn more about the fascinating area of bio-derived polymers. Thanks for having me, you guys. And so we're, we've been super excited about this, and we really just want to hear your company's origin story. So how did you and your team come up with the idea of building these companies, Checkerspot and Wonder Alpine? So, I mean, the idea for the company grew out of Charlie Dimler and myself, my co-founder's experience in industrial biotechnology and working at a company where we saw a lot of innovation, but it was very challenging to animate those innovations in a way that people could understand and to give us traction to actually get those things into the marketplace. And from our previous experience, we had a few examples of being able to do that. And what we saw in those examples were that animating a technology, getting a finished product into the hand of a consumer was critically important, really to building the technology and building a company. And the idea of the what, what would the technology be, really grew out of our previous experience. We had a lot of experience working in and with microalgae. We knew them to be very robust from uh, an industrial biotechnology perspective. We could scale them to very large scales. They, we could manipulate them, genetically engineer them very easily, very facilely. We could tailor their outputs, you know, get them to make things that you would never see in microalgae in nature. So a really great platform. But at the same time, we realized that if we were going to go down this path, we immediately needed to start thinking about a brand, a way to animate the technology and connect it direct to consumers and not simply be making point molecules that we would go and, you know, sell to large industrial chemical companies, because there is no connection to a consumer when you're trying to do that. And these large companies, what they want is something that they can drop in for what they use today, and it's cheaper. And those two things don't align when you're a startup industrial biotechnology company. You don't have scale, and therefore you don't have price. And so you're constantly fighting this uphill battle. What the brand allowed us to do is, again, to animate, to connect directly with consumers. The same reason why you guys are excited about talking about what we do is why that approach works. The other thing it does is it allows us to begin to understand the molecules that we're making. Again, if we were just peddling molecules to large chemical companies, there's no focusing mechanism around which to do formulation and applications development. They're going to do all that. We don't see any of that. With a brand, and particularly with Wonder Alpine, where our, our first products are backcountry skis, we have to solve specific problems with the polymers we're developing. We need to have a certain hardness. We need to have a certain tensile strength. We need to have a certain just robustness in terms of the physical properties of the material. And we're the ones that have to develop that around the monomer, the molecule, the point molecule that our platform makes. Then the other part of the question when we started was, well, what's the brand? What is the product? And actually, that took us a while. I would say it was probably about a year. We, we incorporated the company in 2016. We knew what the platform would be. And then we had been thinking about outdoor. 
we had been thinking about some product. I, I kind of call them charismatic megafauna in the product world. What's something that people are really going to care about when they go by? Making post-it notes wouldn't be it. That wouldn't get people excited. <laughs> <laughs> But if you think about like backcountry skiing and you think, think about the marketing aspects of it, the images sell the product. I mean, people look at, you know, when you look at some of the people at Wonder Alpine, Matt Sturbins, uh, Pep Fuyas in charge of, you know, marketing and brand at Wonder who are just premier skiers. And these people are, you know, in your videos and your marketing campaign that allows you to sell what you're doing, to animate what you're doing in a way that many other product embodiments never would. From a polymer perspective, a ski is a great place to go explore. If you look at the layup of a ski, there's anywhere from, you know, eight to 12 different materials in a ski, in a layup. All of those are opportunities for us that we can go explore and see if we can increase the bio-based content, improve the performance over the incumbent material, while at the same time addressing issues around sustainability and circularity. So as a first product from a marketing perspective and from, again, this idea of animating the technology, it's a really, really good place to be. So that's how we kind of arrived at that sort of segment, the outdoor segment as a really fertile ground and a way to animate the technology. That's really cool. Were you looking at other potential applications? I know that, you know, backcountry skis isn't probably the first thing that comes to mind when you think of what your polymers could be used for. What else were you looking at? Well, in the early days, and even when we settled on outdoor, we were looking at things like water sport applications. You know, you could think surf, particularly paddle boards, things like that. Textiles. We know that there's still a very great need in textile finishes to move away from things like perfluorinated chemistries. Europe has moved completely away from those. Most of the companies in North America have projects, plans in place to to try and do away with those types of textile finishes. So that was definitely a big need. And so as the company evolved and we settled on outdoor recreation, we settled on skis, we really took the first material we had that we thought would be deployable in a ski, which was a high density foam. And we used it to lightweight the skis, but almost immediately we began other projects around other types of polymers and now have moved pretty heavily into textile finishes. So we expect those finishes in the coming years to, to have a place in Wonder Alpine because Wonder Alpine is an outdoor brand. So we would expect, you know, in the next few years to have textiles, garments, packs, things of that nature treated with our textile finishes as a replacement for these perfluorinated chemistries. So if you look at outdoor recreation, again, there's all manner of materials used in that space. So there's just multiple opportunities through and with this brand to continue to animate the technology. Very, very different materials. And ideally, we grow these materials, we develop these materials out of, from a practical perspective, as few of these triglyceride oils uh, as we need to. So that's part of what we're, you know, what we're trying to develop as well from an application and formulation perspective. One follow-up question is you mentioned these perfluorinated chemistries. Just briefly, could you explain what that is and what exactly the problem with that is in the current day and age? Yeah. So perfluorinated chemistries are basically, they're, you know, sometimes they're referred to as C8 or C6 chemistries. And basically what that describes is, you know, carbon molecules that are six to eight carbons long that are decorated with fluorine groups. Fluorine is a Hmm. wonderful, So think Teflon. Teflon is a a, a fluorinated molecule. And the beauty of Teflon, obviously, is that, you know, stuff doesn't stick to it. Soil doesn't stick to it. It's very oleophobic. It repels oil. It repels water. Great. The challenge and the problem with these chemistries is that they're biopersistent. They can be shed from the garment or the pan or whatever. And once they're in the environment, they not only do they biopersist, they can bioaccumulate. And they definitely can cause issues with endocrine function. Where the endocrine system relates to the systems of the human body that regulate hormone function. So needless to say, having any sort of interference with that can have serious ramifications on human health. 
And so it's just recognized, you know, generally speaking, when things start to accumulate in, in the environment, there can be a lot of concern around those. And so there's a lot of data linking these, again, to sort of endocrine dysfunction and things like that. So there's really a push to move away from them. The challenge is they are really good at what they do. And when you're trying to find a replacement, that's the challenge. The bar is, fluorine is really sort of the, the high bar in terms of those types of physical properties. And going more into the technology, for our audience, could you explain the technology that CheckerSpot is focused on industrializing? And, you know, we had mentioned this microalgae in the introduction, and now we're talking about skis and plastics. How does, how does all this stuff tie together? Yeah, complicated. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so and it, it derives from the challenge of when you want to do this and you're a small startup, how best to do it. So... We're, you know, we're a company of fewer than 40 people, but we're, you know, our ski in terms of the raw materials that go into it, we're incredibly vertically integrated. So our technology, the way we view it, has three distinct pillars. There's the piece called the molecular foundry. That's the organism that makes the triglyceride oils. When, so we grow those in large fermenters. We feed the microalgae sugar. When we do that and we withdraw the nitrogen source, their biology is if they have sugar and no nitrogen, they convert that sugar into oil. We don't do anything to make them do that. That's what they do. What we do is we tailor their outputs. We alter the type of triglyceride they want, depending upon the, the specific polymer need or end use application for the oil that we have. So that's the molecular foundry piece. And so once we have that dried biomass, we extract that oil. You can do it mechanically, or you can do it with solvent or a combination of the two. It's the exact same way that you process vegetable oils from say soybeans or peanuts or canola. The, the processes, the, the machines, the machinery, they look the same. So now you've got an oil. The next piece of our technology is what we call the material science and polymer chemistry piece. We take that oil and we're typically doing some type of chemical modification on it so that it's now reactive to the various types of chemistries that we use. One of the principal chemistries is polyurethane chemistry. So we take this oil and we turn it into a molecule that will be reactive in those polyurethane chemistries. And the material science part of that is now taking that molecule, it's called now a polyol, and that's one of the, one of the sides of polyurethane chemistry. The other side is what's called the isocyanate side of it. When you react a polyol and an isocyanate together, you have a urethane. And so we make that polyol component. So the material science piece of that is doing a lot of applications and formulation development work. So that polyol and that isocyanate are just two molecules, but there's a lot of other monomers that you can put into those chemistries that will impact the physical properties, the performance of the final material and the physical state of the final material. So we make a polyurethane that is a foam, a hard foam. So it's sort of airy and less dense. We also make a polyurethane that is what's called a cast urethane. It looks like, oh, I don't know, you could make dishware out of it or a countertop or, you know, it looks like an epoxy, right? Same raw material inputs, but just with a few formulation tweaks, a very different physical state. So that central piece of our technology Polymer science and material science gets us to the thing, the polymer itself. Then the third part, and, and today this is entirely embodied here in Salt Lake City at Wonder Alpine, is fabrication. So, okay, we've got a polymer. What are we going to turn it into? You know, I could make uh, coupons, blocks and foam and cast urethane and go shop those around and show them to people and say, what do you think? What the fabrication piece allows us to do, and this, this again is animated through the brand, is we're turning that into an article, a backcountry ski. Um, so we've got to build skis. So we manufacture skis here in Salt Lake. But, you know, kind of cheek and jowl with that is that material science polymer chemistry piece. So while we're formulating, we can be prototyping. So we can make an entirely new polymer and actually be on the snow in about three days. Um, wow. And we could just keep iterating that process. So, 
So the folks in Wonder Alpine, you know, again, expert skiers, you know, we've got a new idea and we've incorporated a new polymer into, you know, some component of the ski or a new foam. They can be out on the snow in 72 hours looking and testing on that material. And so that's, when you go back to what I said, we're not, we're not a company that's shopping molecules around and going and asking, say, a Dow or a DuPont, you know, what do you think of this molecule? What do you think of that molecule? We would never get that kind of feedback in terms of our molecules and formulation and applications development. I can almost say never, maybe we could in a few years, but we're not going to get it in 72 hours. And so again, that, that points to this value of brand as a way to, to animate and focus the technology so that our, our learning cycle is really, really short. Talking a little bit more about a specific element of the technology, which I'm definitely curious about is you mentioned tailoring the output of these microalgae and in an earlier part of this conversation. And what do you mean by that? Right. So, you know, when you, when you, you probably don't think about vegetable oils. <laughs> <laughs> Not often, no. <laughs> so, you know, what makes olive oil, olive oil, and what makes, you know, coconut oil, coconut oil, the difference in the physical properties of those oils, their behaviors and their end uses is first and probably foremost is their fatty acid composition. If we take a step back and we think about what is a vegetable oil, it's, a, it's what's called a triacylglycerol. And very simply, it is a three carbon glycerol backbone with three fatty acids attached to that glycerol backbone. So triacylglycerol, makes sense. And the thing that differentiates oils is the nature of those fatty acid components, at least one of the things that differenti differentiates them. So the way those fatty acids can differ is how long are the carbon chains? So in vegetable oils, those will be eight carbons long to as long as 24 carbons long. A second point of differentiation is the number of double bonds or if they have double bonds. So if we have double bonds, we say that those are unsaturated fatty acids. If we have no double bonds, they're fully saturated, fully hydrogenated. Third point of differentiation is whether they have functional groups on them. So for example, castor oil, which is a, a common oil, it's used in polymer chemistry. It's stuff that you used to give, I don't know, maybe not me when I was a little kid, but probably my parents, because they thought it was good for you, but it's really not. Um, <laughs> but oftentimes it's, you know, it's used as a laxative, for example, but it's also a polymer feedstock. <laughs> castor oil is hydroxylated. So it's, a, it's what's called a naturally or a natural oil polyol. It is an oil that can also be used directly in polyurethane chemistry because it has this functionality of a hydroxyl group on it. Okay. And then there's a fourth way that we can tailor. So we can do all of these things. We can control chain link. We can control saturation. We can control functionality the presence or absence of functional groups like hydroxyl groups. And then the last thing you can control actually, and, and, and this is done in higher plant oil seeds all the time, is where those fatty acids go on that glycerol backbone. So that's called regiospecificity. So the fact that there's an 18 carbon long always at the first position on a glycerol rather than at the second can impact and does impact the physical properties of the oil. So if you tailor all those things, it gives you, I won't say infinite, but a wide, wide array of triglyceride-based monomers that you can do chemistry with. And one additional question to that is, how exactly do you go about doing that? You know, are you modifying, didn't quite sound like this was the case, but correct me if I'm wrong, are you modifying the genetic code of this algae or are you, you know, changing the environment for which they're in to perturb the type of triglycerides they produce? I'm just curious how that mechanism works. We use everything. <laughs> so <laughs> genetic modification, those really usually fall, you know, there's two ways to do that. So one way we do that is modifying our microalgae's own endogenous genome. So by mm -hmm. upregulating or downregulating a specific gene, uh, we can get it to elaborate a particular type of triglyceride oil, and that will take us so far. But the real, you know, the real repository of genetic information that we tap into comes from what we call higher plant oil seeds. So these are seeds in nature. 
that make triglyceride oils. And if you, if you go out in nature and you look at these seeds, you, what you find is if we look at what's called the oleochemicals industry today. Where the term oleochemical describes the study of vegetable oils as well as animal oils and fats. This field is also interested in studying fatty acids. There's about 14 or so fatty acids that are produced on those oils. And these are all the oils that come from everything from oilseed crops like peanuts and soybean and canola and coconuts to marine sources, fish oils. If you look at that whole spectrum, maybe 14 or 15 fatty acids. If you go out in nature and you look at seeds that you know are growing in the wild, they're never going to be grown as agricultural crops. They're never going to be commoditized. You can find close to five to 600 distinct fatty acid species out there in nature. So what our, you know, what our shtick is, is we're able to take these oil seeds and we do what's called a transcriptome analysis on them. So we can see in that seed, what are all the messenger RNAs? What are all the genes that were turned on in that seed? And by extension, you know, that we believe, well, gee, those mRNAs must have played a role in elaborating whatever the oil is in that seed. So we start with the seed, we determine what its fatty acid profile is and its oil content. And then at the same time, we analyze the transcriptome of that seed. And then using a bioinformatics approach, because we're pretty good at that, we can sort of take <laughs> all of those sequences and we can put them in buckets. So, you know, this bucket looks like they're genes for controlling fatty acid chain length. Those are enzymes called thioesterases. And this bucket of, of transcripts from that oil seed, they look like they're desaturases. So they're going to incorporate double bonds. And this other bucket over here, that's interesting. Those look like they might be hydroxylases. They might put on a hydroxyl functionality. In our, our platform organism, we have developed it to such an extent that it's relatively easy to take all those candidates and then put those into what we call expression cassettes, transform those into our microalgae. And because our microalgae are really, really good at making oil, we can get feedback on what those genes actually do in our microalgae. And if we get something that looks interesting, then we kind of do a deeper dive and try and develop that strain, develop that gene, maybe go back to that oil seed, look for additional, what we call partner enzymes that might enhance that function. So it's a, we have a pretty well worked out process where we can get line of sight to making something that's really novel.